Hello, boys and girls. Welcome to the 28th Amendment. I'm your host, Marshal Gregory Thomas. Um, and congratulations to the, uh, uh, the royal family for the new edition. Um, always nice to see something good work out for people, especially in this day and age. Now, um, we were talking about the 28th Amendment. Um, now, this is the Tiny Concert Series. Uh, a little too early to blast music at the household, but... Uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll do a Tiny Concert later this evening. Um, I'm going to pick up on our talk about uh, the 28th Amendment and specifically um, our economic destiny. Um, the fact that our government is a system of legalized bribery and extortion. I mean, it's uh, uh, the, the big money guys, they, you know, they write the checks, but also periodically, you know, that time of year, the politicians start working the phones and they have a cold call list and they'll just call up uh, major corporations or, or very wealthy individuals and they'll just solicit donations. So, you know, and, and the person being called, you know, they might be kind of wary and they might not want to give this politician, you know, 50000 or $200,000 for the reelection. But the implications of if they don't, they don't know, you know, how they're going to be viewed by this person if they get elected. So it's a two-way street. Um, so, you know, we can blame these individuals, these politicians, but it's a process. You know, even the most... Um, ardent reformer can go to this town, Washington, D.C., and I lived there for years, you know, in Arlington, and, uh, you know, you, you, you pick up on what's going on there, and anyone who goes into that town who's like a fire-breathing reformer, anyone who goes in there with a cause or a major reform effort, you know, they'll stay around for one or two election cycles at most, but if they come in there and they try and change the way that business is done in that town, you know, it's only a matter of time before they're just going to be moved out. I mean, they'll be successful for one or two election cycles, like I said. But you're not going to be, you know, somebody who's an ardent reformer and, and sticks to their guns and is trying to fundamentally change an aspect of the system who goes into that town is not going to be staying there very long. <laughs> That's just the way it is. And the people who, who do take the money and who you know, go along to get along, these people are reelected at a rate of approaching 98%. Um, you know, it's, this is kind of like a recidivism rate. <laughs> you know, they reoffend. You know, they get reelected. It's, it's essentially, they're, 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 it's power for life. It's, you know, it's, it's, they become, you know, one of the 500 most powerful individuals in the country and arguably in the world. And they get to stay there as, as they go along with the program they take the money, you know, when push comes to shove, they vote the way they should. And uh, so it's essentially they're in power for life. And, you know, this is not the system that our founding fathers envisioned. So, you know, our current political, economic, and military order is not functioning correctly. Um, it's not functioning correctly for the man on the street, you know, like you and me, you know, the people on Main Street, certainly, not for the last 30 years. And it is not even functioning correctly for the ultimate trajectory and destiny of uh, the United States of America and for the well-being of Western civilization. So we're on a path for, of dysfunction. And, you know, sometimes these things play themselves out differently. Sometimes the, the empire will slowly fade away into, into irrelevance, you know, and it's a process that takes, you know, 100 or 200 years of this slow, you know, kind of degradation. And other times, uh, you see in history that these empires go up to a certain point and everything's fine, everything's fine, and then suddenly, you know, it's that one little straw that breaks the camel's back, and seemingly out of nowhere, you know, there's a cascade of events and the whole thing comes crashing down. So, you know, it could go either way, but, you know, the current, the current way that this system is functioning, you know, where we've had essentially the same problems for 30 years, 
and nothing's getting resolved. And, and in fact, these problems are being exacerbated and becoming worse and worse over time. Uh, this is not a recipe for success or longevity. And this republic is at the 250 year mark almost. And so, um, you know, there's a trajectory for, you know, in, in economics, you study product life cycles. There's a trajectory for a product life cycle. And also you look back in history, you know, you, look, you read Gibbon and there's a, there's a trajectory and a life cycle for, for individuals, you know, the Plutarch's lives. But there's also an, a trajectory, you know, in essence, for, for nation states, empires and civilizations. And what we want to do is reform this system and optimize and renew and reinvigorate and revivify and maintain the Pax Americana, the peace of the world, um, for, you know, set up this century to be a new American century. Um, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to reinvigorate the American middle class. The American middle class was arguably one of the uh, most important um, um, innovations in, in uh, human history. What we saw was the largest, um, you know, the middle 50% perhaps of the, of the American population had achieved a standard of living that had never been equaled in the world. So this is a greater mass of people at a greater level, you know, a greater standard of living that had happened had ever happened anywhere in the world. And it wasn't just about, you know, your economic standard of living, that there's, there's a, a family breadwinner, the, the man, and, and he goes off to work in the morning and he comes home and parks his car in the two-car garage and the house in the suburbs and the wife and the 2.2 kids. You know, we, we stereotype it and characterize it, but, you know, this, this uh, the ethos, the, the spirituality, the intellectual, fantastic nature of the of the uh, of the society of the country, um, and just the you know history is dynamic. So you know it's not like there was a conflict, and at times incredible conflicts. It's not like there wasn't danger, but the the standard of living and the and the quality of life and the just the sheer fantastic experience of being middle class in the United States of America is something that we have lost in our society. And with it, with these economic, political, and uh, also spiritual conditions that have, have slowly eroded over the decades that were there in post-World War II America for three decades, in the, through the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, there was a kind of collective ethos of that you know, a, a, a belief in America and a belief in ourselves, a belief in people and authority, authority figures. Um, and lots of factors have, have eroded this, not least of which has been the media and our own self-doubts and our own self-criticisms. Uh, you know, Sigmund Freud, uh, when he looked at Western civilization, he worried, one of the things he worried about was the corrosive effects of guilt. You know, Western civilization has always been only too, too um, happy, and that was one of our greatest strengths, was our ability to examine ourselves, you know, like Escher looking into the, into the, the orb and, and, and looking back at ourselves and seeing the many facets of, of not, not really, you know, lauding our accomplishments, but looking very critically at what we've done wrong in the past. And this has become kind of a kind of a guilt porn, kind of a shame porn. I mean, we've just been rolling around in this unimaginable self-criticism and guilt. And the self-criticism has been raised to such a level that it's disabling. And it's almost like uh, the Marxists would get a, uh, a room full of, you know, the Chinese communists and the Russians, but spe specifically the, uh, Mao used this, crowd a bunch of people in, you know, and your workers and, and students into a small room and you stay there for four hours and you all stand up like an AA meeting and take turns um, in, in uh, proclaiming self-criticism. So you would stand up and say, I have bourgeois tendencies, yada, 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 I own a pet and the, and the you know, the, the food that I give to this small animal, you know, it could feed, you know, it could be going to feed a worker's family and so... I'm going to turn in my pet, you know, or, 
or I have bourgeois tendencies. You know, I used to, I used to play sports, but this is this is a waste of time. I should be, you know, working towards the goals of the revolution and yada yada yada. But but essentially, you know, you're rolling around, you're criticizing each other, you're criticizing yourself, and so they're installing this this. Uh, in your own mind, they're installing a filter, you know, so they, they don't, the commissar doesn't have to be standing over you at all times telling you, you know, what to do and what's, what's approved and what isn't. You become your own commissar. You become, become your own jailer, in effect, mentally. And so um, what we've seen in our societies has come to pass is actually something not, not entirely dissimilar from uh, these, the, 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 the amount of guilt and shame that's, that we've heaped upon ourselves and has been heaped upon us, and self-doubt and self-criticism uh, very much resembles the Marxist ideology and means of control. So, you know, we're in a post-ideological world. Um, communism has failed. Fascism has failed. Uh, neoliberalism is bust. You know, all the isms... Uh, Political correctness, postmodernism, interchangeable concepts, they're, they're both, it's neo-Marxism, okay? It's uh, the same old song with a different tune since you've been gone, okay? <laughs> Gotta love your Motown. But, um, um, and what we're seeing is this system fail, and it's not just psychological and spiritual um, instilled uh, sabotage, um, it's also the, the tr real economic consequences of the decisions that have been made that we're losing. We've lost more than 600,000 people to uh, chemical suicide. Um, everywhere in the world, life expectancy is rising except here where life expectancy is going down. And the only precedent for this is the AIDS plague where we lost 600,000 Americans. The collapse of the Soviet Union in, uh, in the early 90s, where people were standing out on the side of the road, starving to death, selling all of their possessions in a desperate attempt to eat. Um, a mass die-off, in other words. Um, the, the mass die-off of the, in, the, in the world of uh, the, the influenza um, uh, plague of uh, epidemic of 1918. Um, these are world-changing events, and this is what's happening to our society. And so while we're, you know, you, you turn on the media, and there's this three-ring circus and a dog and pony show and telling you what's important, well, what's really important is we're in the middle of a mass die-off, okay? And these are economic as well as spiritual uh, conditions. So, you know, what are we going to do about it <laughs> uh, is the real question. And the answer to that is um, we're going to uh, we're going to basically bring back the middle class, and we're going to do this with the Twenty Eighth Amendment, which is going to fundamentally transform our political system as as we know it. And um, so, in in the near term, what we saw in the twenty sixteen election, what what I interpret it as a peasant revolt. You have on the left Bernie Sanders uh, a student movement, student youth movement, and this is a, an urban, metropolitan, um, university uh, uh, young people on the left supporting Bernie Sanders to fundamentally, you know, it's, it's a peasant revolt, and uh, outside, outside of these, in, within the established parties, but actually it's an outsider coming in to. For, you know, take over from within and fundamentally change, you know, not just the party, but the political system. And uh, other than Bernie Sanders, at the same time, it's a divided peasant revolt. On the right, you have uh, have had the Donald Trump um, rural, largely rural, working class um, peasant revolt movement. And these are both outsiders, essentially. I mean, Bernie Sanders isn't even a Democrat, okay? And, and Donald Trump wasn't even a politician. So this is the voters, in all their wisdom, trying to get an outsider like, you know, like Jimmy Carter was uh, in, in 1976. Bring in somebody who's totally outside of Washington, D.C. Bring somebody in and shake up this system. And fundamentally, what they want, unconsciously or consciously, is to fundamentally transform our political system and fix what is going wrong within the beltway. Um, 
because you know the the power elite have things just the way they want them and it's it's currently it's working out as a disaster not just for the individual on main street but for the ultimate destiny of of united states of america our republic and western civilization as a whole now you know <clears throat> both political parties have created this american nightmare okay it wasn't just the republicans it wasn't just the democrats um and it's not entirely clear that, you know, for the working men and women, for the working class, that the Republicans, you know, since they've been abandoned by the Democrats, who've taken up, you know, tribalism and uh, identity politics, it's not entirely clear that the Republican Party is the answer to, the, to the, what ails the working class, you know, that has been ultimately destroyed by the uh, economic decisions made in the last 25 or 30 years. Um, so electing a Donald Trump or electing a Bernie Sanders is not going to ch fundamentally change what goes on in the Beltway. What we have to do is change the system. Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are just one person. They are not going to change the system. The only people who can change the political system inside the Beltway is you, you and me. Um, just common every day, working stiffs, you know, Work, whether we're working under the, you know, the fluorescent lights, you know, um, and you get to wear a white sh shirt and a tie, and, and you're typing away on your keyboard, or whether you're, you know, you're, you're in transportation, or <clears throat> you're, you're working class, you know, you work outside, or, or um, you know, uh, you know, you, you work in manufacturing or the service industry, um, you know. There's there's uh, there's something really uh, fundamentally uh, invigorating to, to actually do muscular labor. So um, I've done more than that, my fair share of that through the years. All the, all those jobs that uh, we currently bring in uh, illegal aliens. This is a PC free zone, so the, the legal term it's a legal term is illegal aliens. Okay, and this was established in law. So we're going to use exact wording, and we're, we're going to stay away from political correctness because this is part of neoliberalism. Uh, excuse me, I apologize. This is part of neo-Marxism. Now, in the, in the film 1984, um, you, have, uh, you have William Hurt is being tortured. Um, he's being electrocuted. He's, he's on the table. And, and uh, Richard Burton, Burton is standing there over him, and he says, how many fingers am I holding up? And, and, and Hurt, you know, he already, you know he's, been, he's been jolted by 800 uh, volts of electricity numerous times, so he's, right, he's, he's already been pushed past his limit you know, of, of what he can take. And so he's desperate, and he realizes this is a trap, okay? <laughs> and Richard Burton, you know, number one, you know, is torturing this guy, number number ninety nine. You know, on the on the in the social hierarchy, and he says, "How many fingers am I holding up?" And, and Hurt knows it's a trap, and he says, uh, four? <laughs> and zap!" You know, and Richard Burton very methodically reaches over and turns up the turns it up to a thousand volts, and then hits him. You know, and he's. And his whole body convulses, and it's it's very believable if you've ever seen the real thing. I mean, this guy is, he's he's getting lit up like a Christmas tree, and and, and he says, "What what do you want me to say? Just tell me what you want me to say. I'll say anything, you know." And he says, "No, how many fingers? The answer to how many fingers I'm holding up is three. And he says. Okay, okay. And he says, how many fingers am I holding up? And he says, three, three. And he goes, zap. And he goes, ah. And, you know, and it, all that juice courses through his body for like at least 10 seconds before, you know, I'll just let it, let him suffer. And then he turns it off and, ah. And he's like, oh, I don't understand. You know, he says, well, you must believe that I'm holding up three fingers. It's not sufficient for you to say it. You must believe it, you know. You must convince me that you really believe it. You know, if I say black is white, you, you not only have to say that black is white, you have to believe it. You know, you have to love the party. You know? And this is, you know, when you're controlling people's 
language. You're controlling their minds. And so um, in 1984, they're rewriting the dictionary, okay? So they're coming up, they're, they're getting rid of all these words. And instead of, instead of, you know, the English language has, you know, 800,000 or a million words, <laughs> of which, you know, I know about five or 800. <laughs> Probably is about as much, many as Coco the, the gorilla, unfortunately. But, um, okay, so there's 800,000 words in the English language. Well, they're, they're essentially, they're compressing and compressing and compressing the English language down to these, to these, you know, opposites and these very narrow opposites to where people's minds are going to be constrained. You know, you have double plus good, you know, is the only positive you can say. You can't come up with, you know, a thousand synonyms for something positive. You can say double plus good. And so by compressing the dictionary down, 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 and only allowing people to learn this, this nomenclature, you're controlling their minds. You're, you're confining their thoughts, and it's the ultimate form of control. So political correctness, you know, is a lot of people understand it as an attempt to remake the world, a kind of utopianism, but actually it's very much an Orwellian form of control. It is very neo-Marxist. Uh, let's make no mistake, you know. <laughs> I, um, <clears throat> I, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, uh, you know, when you're 21, you, you have this megalomaniacal view of the world. You want, you, you're convinced, I was convinced, that we could fix all the crap that the older generations had foisted upon us and we could remake the world, you know, why was everything the way it was, you know, you know, to heck with all, everything that came before, you know, we're going to create a utopia. This was very much, you know, we can, we can, re, we can just get rid of all the old garbage and we're going to remake the world. This is a very natural thing to do, a very natural way to feel, to be a political radical. And that's basically what I was most of my life. Um, and, you know, later I became a little more moderate, <laughs> but not much. <laughs> so I'm, I was basically, all my life, I was to the left of Bernie Sanders, really. I was a classical liberal. Um, but, you know, part of the function is just the age of man. You know, you get into middle age, you're not 21 anymore. And a, part of it is just getting a lot of, you know, real lot world experience, and, as well as reading a lot more. But, you know, foreign travel is, it helps a lot as well. But uh, then, you know, just the events in the last 10 years uh, uh, have been, uh, you know, if you're not constantly reevaluating things, you know, you, you don't have the same, like when you're 21, you don't have the same worldview as you did when you were, when you were a 10-year-old kid. <laughs> okay, you change, you evolve, you see the world differently. Well, you know, in, in middle age, you're going to hopefully see the world a lot differently than you did when you were 18 or 21. And so I don't blame people who are, you know, who, who espouse political correctness. And you go to university and basically you're, you're, you're more or less proselytized and brainwashed. So everyone around you, your professors, the authority figures, you know, we, we see ourselves as revolutionaries, but ultimately we're just complete conformists, <laughs> you know, we go along to get along, and, and you don't realize that, uh, that your opinions are given to you, but that's exactly what's happening. So I've broken out, and um, I'm coming at this from a different angle, and, you know, a Donald Trump or a Bernie Sanders, to, to go try and get back to, on, on track here, these, this one person is not going to change this system, Okay. And we need the 28th Amendment. So let's digress again. I apologize. You know, democracy, uh, it's, it's really an experiment that began about 2,500 years ago in the Greek city-states where citizens are invested in the decision-making. You know, you have a population in Athens, for instance, of about 150 or 250,000 people, you know, and... Fewer than half of these are citizens, and at the core, there's a lot of really wealthy people who, who can afford to, like, come into town. There's about six or ten, six thousand, ten thousand people who are basically, 
you know, upper middle class to wealthy and they come in and they can afford to sit there all day and, and decide these important questions. But when the most important questions come up, you know, the artisans, the day laborers, these people come and, and sit at the uh, sit at the seat of power. I'm sorry, I'm not functioning very well today. <laughs> Going to have to get a little more caffeinated. I'm, I'm losing my terminology, the Greek terminology. Um, but they they come sit below the pantheon in, in the place of, of meeting in the meeting place and they decide these fundamental questions of of you know life and death you know peace and war and, and the nature of their society as it changes who is a citizen and who is not you know who is a citizen and who is not a citizen were some of the most important fundamental questions these people could decide so what you have is, you know, citizens who are invested very personally in decision making and, and as well as a share of the rewards of the of the society. It was very much, a, you know, a shared reward system. So these democracy, you know, have all these little city states, literally um, practically thousand of these things, 1500 maybe. And, you know, they're all about, you know, it varied, it varied quite a bit, but, you know, 2000 people, 2500 people would not be unusual. Well, Athens at its peak, you know, you're looking at about 200,000 people. It's very extended across the Peloponnese. And, um, and so, uh, you know, just, just the system became accidentally chosen, democracy, as the best performing, the, giving the best outcomes. Now, you know, a lot of things, there was a lot of back and forth and evolution so it wasn't ever static, you know. But this these, this system was able to outperform these other systems because, you know, everyone's invested. Everyone's getting a share of awards. You get to keep, you know, if everyone's working harder than people in this and better and smarter than the people in this other system. So the Greek city-states took up democracy because the outcomes were so darn good. They're, they're obviously, they're looking at, the other city-states, they're all in competition. Well, who's succeeding the best? Well, the democracies are actually working better, you know, more dynamic, more resourceful, more wealthy, you know, and uh, better led in the people, you know, spiritually, you know, and uh, materially, they're getting better outcomes. So, it, you know, nobody's imposing this on these people. Um, so they're able to outperform others in the sheer economic productivity, and then also importantly in their adaptability in the art of warfare because this is a very dynamic uh, environment that these city-states are evolving in. Now in the East you have this superpower you know and, and in the East the king the Persian emperor the Persian king he controls every man's destiny everything good or bad flows from his hands you know so it's not a you know it's not a collective you know decision-making and the collective wisdom and, and um, you know, diffused power throughout the society. This is very much a top-down situation. So, you know, the Greeks, they invented, there was a sudden explosion of creativity, kind of like the, you know, you look in the fossil record, um, it's something called the Precambian ex uh, pre explosion. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little slow today. It's Monday, and I'm struggling. The Precambian um, explosion was essentially... You know, you're, you're going along in the fossil record and you're looking and then all of a sudden there's just this incredible proliferation of a myriad form, life forms. So it was like somebody flipped a switch in the fossil record and all of a sudden it's just like kapow, you know. You see this incredible explosion of life forms that's just almost miraculous, you know. It's like, where did that come from, you know. This is about 250, almost 300 million years ago. I'm, you're going to have to Google that one, sorry. Um... Uh, I, I haven't plugged into Google in my head yet, but I'm sure they're getting around to it very soon. Okay, so this is exactly what you see in, in, in human civilization is this period in, of Greek civilization. This is the moment. This is the explosion of myriad creativity in, in the history of humanity. It was never equal before or since. I mean, what happened in these Greek city-states? So this is why this is important. <laughs> this is like looking, and if, if you're a paleontologist, this, this is like looking at the fossil record and looking at the Precambrian explosion and trying to figure out 
what in the world is going on here? This is unbelievable. So this is exactly what happened in Greece. I mean, they, you know, Western civilization, you can't sell it short. There's no comparison to any other civilization of what happens in Greece and in Western civilization over the next 2,500 years. It is incredible explosion of creativity and productivity that you can't find anywhere else in all of human history. So we need to keep this in mind. We need to know who we are, where we came from, you know, and then, you know, we, we can perhaps, then we can start as individuals and as a, as a nation and as a civilization, perhaps we can start to care for ourselves like we should, you know, treat yourself like someone who's, who's worthy of being taken care of and worthy of love and respect, you know. Uh, we have to get past this shame porn, okay, the guilt porn. You've got to stop letting them do this to you. This is a means of psychological control. If you look at a lot of these runaway religions, what they do is they kind of grab you by the, the drive, you know, and they instill guilt and shame into you as a means of controlling your mind and controlling your behavior and your ultimate destiny. This is control through shame. This is very much what theocracies do. Well, this neoliberalism is controlling you and will ultimately destroy you with guilt and shame. You need to snap the hell out of it, okay? Good. Okay. So, back to this Western civilization in Greece. They invented in this epoch of, of incredible creativity, they invent the, the process of democracy, but they invent science. I mean, everything we think of as science, you know, then and now, they invented science. There's the scientific method and everything that flowed from that, all that creativity. Uh, they invented mathematics, um, architecture. You know, their architecture is, is unparalleled and we still, we still have our, have our, mon our monumental, you know, um, um, gen genuflect in their direction. You know, it's, it's these, these temples like the Supreme Court building, you know, you look at this and you're looking at, to, at the, that Precambrian explosion of human creativity. You're looking at, at Greek democracy. You're looking at Athens, Greece, you know, and it's like a prayer. It's like, it's like a, it's like a living, breathing reminder of where we've come from, who we are, and our aspirations, you know, as, as a people and as humanity, as, as bringers of good for humanity. So this is very important to understand, you know, we, we, can, we created mathematics, science, architecture, we created uh, theater, you know, the dynamism of, uh, of Hollywood and the dynamism of, you know, of uh, the arts and theater um, in, in the theater district in New York on Broadway and, you know, we've got going back basically from the Elizabethan age to the present, you know, the sheer creativity. I mean, how much joy and fascination and, and real life we've given to people just through theater, which has become film, of course, the art form. And we're living in the golden age of television and everybody's transfixed by Game of Thrones and this kind of thing. But this was created in Athens, Greece. So this entire intellectual world we're walking around in, our entire way of seeing the universe, ourselves, and everything around us, and moving through this space and time, this is an invention, a creation of Greece 2,500 years ago. This is Western civilization, and it's now the de facto, essentially, headspace of the entire world. So, okay, so democracy would often fail. You know, we're, we're failing right now. Uh, we're, everything's kind of going sideways and down for the last 30 years, you know, economically, but also intellectually and spiritually, um, politically, militarily. And, and, you know, if you've been around long enough, you can see this, you know, from the 60s, 70s, you know, uh, 80s, 90s. And I, I have to say that, you know, since the eight, late 80s, uh, the neo-Marxism and basically the political dysfunction, uh, spiritual, intellectual, 
uh, dysfunction within society has been picking up speed. So, you know, it's, it's like a, you know, when things kind of go bad, it's like a, it's, it's, it's kind of starting to feel like a snowball going downhill, <laughs> okay? And, uh, you know, eventually immovable, you know, irresistible force meets a movable object and there's a tremendous explosion. So what we want to do is reform this system and bring back not just the economic, you know, material um, riches, but also the spiritual and intellectual um, uh, gifts that we have received. We were born into the system. We were given these gifts, incomparable, invaluable gifts. And it's our responsibility to, to not only pass along, you know, pass this system and uh, this democracy, this republic, this civilization, to pass this along to the next generation as good as we got it. It is the social compact between generations of Americans to have to create something even better, something more vibrant and more fruitful, and to pass this on to the next generation. And it's, you know, in allowing ourselves to devolve in this way, essentially what we're doing is we're breaking the social compact between generations. We're doing this to, we've done this to millennials, from the baby boomer, boomers, we're, we're doing this to Generation Z, and we've got to stop this prog process. We've got to flip the script, okay? Now, we're failing, well, democracy, you know, it often fail for political reasons. This is, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. This has happened before, so let's look very closely at how the system failed, okay? Why did the system fail previously? And maybe we can understand what's happening to us today. Uh, democracy would always, often, always, often fail periodically for political and economic reasons. You know, these city-states would rise up, they'd do really well for a while, and then they'd get overreaching, and, and they would make mistakes, strategic mistakes, and their economic, political, military mistakes. And these societies would collapse, okay? They would collapse militarily, they would collapse economically, there would be riots and looting and, and you know, destruction in the streets between factions or between economic uh, strata. So factionalism would often paralyze the smooth decision making of, this, of the Greek city-state. And economic inequality would often lead to this kind of unrest where the, the working class, you know, who don't own anything in the artisan class who are working with their hands and creating things, they're at the bottom of the, the socioeconomic ladder, you know, the, the slaves and, and the, are, are below them, but these people, you know, they're being disenfranchised, and all the wealth is accruing to, to a very, you know, small strata, and the, the small farmers are having to literally, they're, they're, they owe these tremendous debts, and they're having to sell their children into slavery, it's not an exaggeration, to pay their debts to the, to the upper strata, and at a certain point, these people can no longer take it, okay? They rise up, and this happens again and again. They rise up, they riot through the streets in a mob, they break into the, you know, the businesses and the homes of the, of the very wealthy, they loot them, and then they burn them. And wherever they find these people, they beat and kill them, okay? And then in the aftermath, you know, it's like the bonfire of the vanities, you know, all the, all the glass and crystal and, and you know, cooking pots and dishes are shattered in the morning after the party and everybody's looking around going, wow, <laughs> what went wrong? <laughs> you know? I mean, this, this is very common. This happened again and again. So the economic, you know, the, the factionalism and the economic inequality were basic factors in the civil unrest that would periodically rise. So in a sense, you know, there's nothing so robust or so fragile as the democratic city-state, you know, robust from outside attack, you know, and their, the military and, and political dynamism of, of you know, 10,000 people or 50,000 people deciding their own collective destiny and the decisions of life and death and war and peace and, and how, to imp, how to implement these, you know. We saw this in World War II, you know, how a dynamic society like the United States goes to war, the Western way of war, and, you know, in three and a half years, on two separate fronts, we win a worldwide war, basically from a standing start. We were basically disarmed, unarmed. You know, we didn't have a, we had like a, a incredibly small military, and we went from a standing start, like, you know, and 
In three and a half years, we win a worldwide war against two evil empires. Almost impossible feat. This is the incredible dynamism of the American Republic. And, you know, that's, that's what you saw in these Greek city-states. That they could take on this evil empire of the Persian Empire that comes marching in with, you know, an army, you know, that, that uh, you know, their campfires blot out the sun. You're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not a million men, you know, from Persia marching into Greece. And ultimately the Greeks are, Greeks are victorious. Not without having to, you know, lose, you know, somewhat along the way. But, but this disparate, you know, collection of city-states of 2,500 people here and 5,000 people there, or, you know, in the case of Athens and Sparta, <clears throat> you know, the Spartans were, you know, hardly ever more than about, you know, five or 10,000 indiv warrior individuals, you know, sometimes more, but uh, these were not, you know, these were not monolithic city-states or, or nations. These were, these were very, it's like herding cats. Well, when they united, when they're attacked from the outside, um, you know, that dynamism come, came through and uh, they defeated this monolithic, you know, world power, the greatest, you know, the greatest e evil empire the world had ever seen. And they did this multiple times. So, you know, it's very resilient from outside attack, but uh, from <clears throat> fragile from within is how I would characterize it, you know. Now, there's always been a tension between rich and poor, you know, and in Athens, it was the country people who owned large tracts of land who were the rich, and it was the city people who were artisans who were making shoes or, or you know, or, you know, cookware or clothing or these people who work with their hands, the artisan class and the merchants, they were poor, generally speaking, and it was the people who could command these large tracts of land outside of the city. So, Today it's reversed. We have city rich, country poor, but then it was country rich, city poor. But it's it's very similar situation, and often in these in these you know in this system, um, an oligarchy of wealthy landowners would essentially slowly assume control. You know from you know like like capture the state from within. You know. Um, You'd had the rule of the 400 families or the 40 families. <clears throat> and so when people see this, this oligarchy rises up. And it's basically the, you know, the billionaire class or the 1% take over, you know, the levers of power from, from within the system. You know, that, that's basically what our republic has become now. It's, it's an oligarchy controlled, you know, controlled by these very powerful individuals and, and, and corporations and not to get too too dogmatic about it, but we are living in an oligarchy. Um, and when the people would see this, an oligarchy rising up, they, they try to push back. Now, what they would do was very similar to what's happened today. We, we see repetition of forms. You know, there's always, it's it's not an exact copy, There's a, but there's a rhyme to it. You know, there's a similarity. Now, the word tyrant back then, 2,500 years ago, meant a benign king who would institute one-man rule as a way of taking power away from the oligarchs. He's taking power from the 40 families of the super-rich, and, and he guides the city-state through a time of chaos and uncertainty, you know, kind of a benign king, this tyrant. So the tyrant wasn't somebody who's going around, you know, taking people's property, taking their freedom, taking their lives. Back then, when, when people said tyrant, it meant the person who comes in as a benign king sets everything right, you know, resets the table, and essentially takes away power back from the oligarchy, from the 40 families, and then redistributes, does what he has to militarily, politically, economically, resets the table, like hitting the, he's, he's supposed to set the reset button and alleviate the, the just political demands, alleviate the suffering uh, of the, you know, of the, of the people in the city by, by taking back the political power from the people, the super rich in the country, these people who control these vast tracts of land in Athens. So tyrant was essentially more or less a good word, and it was a benign king. It was essentially the human reset button on this political process. 
So the democracy is controlled by, you know, the 10,000 people who show up every day, and then it becomes 6,000, and then from within you have this the super rich, wealthy, controlling the vast tracts of land who are producing so much, you know, and the, and the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, and it's just the, the immutable laws of mathematics, of economics, over time, and then they capture the state from within, and then the people, in 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 their you know in in anger and in desperation, you know bring in bring on the tyrant. So, you know, you go from democ democratic city state to oligarchy, and then to tyrant, and then preferably you know sometimes the tyrant would try and usurp absolute power for themselves, but often what was understood was the tyrant was the benign king who resets the table, in effect, and, um, you know, wipes out all debt, you know, says, okay, all debt is wiped out, you know, so anybody that owes, you know, 10,000, you know, gold coins to this super rich landowner, and you're going to have to sell three of your five children into slavery, your debts are wiped out. So this guy, this, this failed farmer, no longer has the impetus to raid, you know, gather a small mob and, and raid the the farm of this super rich guy, you know, steal all his goods, burn his house and, and kill him in order not to essentially sell his children into slave perpetual, you know, torment. I mean, th these people are pushed to the edge, okay, <laughs> when this happens. This, this isn't, you know, this isn't out of convenience. It's not an ideological kind of thing, you know, kind of revolution. This is very much, a, you know, I'm starving to death. I'm, I'm going to have to sell my children into, you know, into slavery. Um, you know, I've lost, I've lost my business. I've lost all my tools for my trade. I've lost everything. I, these are, you know, all I own is these clothes that are falling off of me. I haven't eaten in three days. I can't take it anymore. You know, I mean, these are people pushed to the very limit of their endurance and beyond until they react. This isn't some kind of, you know, boutique revolution. <laughs> okay, so you go from democracy to oligarchy, and then the people, you know, seeking relief, bring, in, bring on the tyrant who, who resets the table, ideally. Now, not, not, not infrequently, the tyrant would try and flip the, the script on them and usurp absolute power for himself. Well... Oftentimes, they literally, the mob turns on this guy and his supporters and, you know, murders him and his friends. But, but sometimes the tyrant is able to subdue the mob and, and keep absolute power for himself. But more often, the bargain was kept, ideally. The tyrant resets the economic political system by wiping out all the debts um, or re reimagining how the the government is set up and run how elections are done re redistributing the power within society and diffusing the power back into the greater whole you know rebooting democracy is what he's supposed to do there i got it on the third time he's rebooting democracy and so this is process of one two three back to one again it's kind of a circular system at least that's my reading of history, however imperfect. Um, so, you know, democracy is the preferred outcome. And, and the oligarchy, you know, would often go along with this without some kind of violence or force because they can see this impending revolt. They've, you know, in their lifetimes, they've seen this happen in other city-states. They can, it's, it's like the temperature in the air becomes explosive. You know, all these small farmers are failing and they've already sold like one or more of their children into slavery, and now they've reached their limit. And you know, it's it's literally it's like a powder keg, you know. So, so the the oligarchs realize that that things are about to explode, literally explode, and collapse. And so they often often, you know, go along with with these reforms, just if nothing else, to save themselves from being dragged down by the revolt, by the revolution. And uh, so these are very dynamic systems, very dynamic societies. Um, and these are happening, you know, this, this process is happening literally in hundreds and hundreds of different city-states. There are probably like 1,500 of these things. So you have this incredible trade 
by ship, you know, these vast fortunes being made. You know, you don't have to get oxen and load them up into carts. You just load up a ship, send it to one place, you trade. You could start with a load of olive. You know, capitalism was incredibly important part of this dynamic. And I'll just briefly touch on that. You could load, you know, you, you own you own some land, you have olive trees. You get, you get, you know, let's say a thousand dollars worth of olive oil. Okay, you pay some guys, you put it in a ship. You you've got a captain and a crew. You're paying them. They go to to a another city state. You know, you have standardized weights and measures. You sell your your thousand dollars worth of olive oil for two thousand dollars because they don't have olive oil. You have the olive oil. <laughs> okay, and you buy some raw materials like raw metal or glass okay you buy some raw glass you go up north where the mines are you trade the glass which is two thousand dollars worth of glass for for three that four thousand dollars worth of of metal you know raw metal copper and tin and then you bring this back and you you you've come back after a week You've got four thousand dollars worth of raw material. You bring it on shore. You pay the guys to unload it, and you make weapons out of the metal. You forge, you know, bronze, um, you know, tools for for making. You know, you, you create a value-added good, and the most valuable thing was actually metal. Metal was magic, you know. Um, so it's a material science processing. So. So now you've actually you've taken your four thousand dollars worth of raw metal <clears throat> and you've mixed it together in the proper constituents and you've created bronze <clears throat> pardon me and you've made you've made tools you've made weapons you've made farm implements you've made you know household goods uh, you know um, eating utensils um, all kinds of value added goods you sell these and you make eight thousand dollars. Okay, now you pay off the ship, you pay off the men, you know, you pay off the people that work for you in the fields and, and all your time, and you've made $4,000 profit off your initial $1,000 investment. Well, it's only been three weeks or 30 days. If you can do this 10 times a year, you're essentially quadrupling your money 10 times in one year and this is only possible because you don't have to load up a cart first of all number one and feed these oxen and go across land which is incredibly costly you don't have to run the gauntlet of robbers so the impetus of this is you have money so now you want things better organized to help you with this process you want standardized weights and measures you want a standardized currency you want a navy that suppresses piracy and theft. You want, you want standardized contracts. You want courts of law that enforce these contracts. This is your, this is your, this is your path to power, you know, and your, your naked self-interest. But it's also in the self-interest of the greatest society, not just your city, state, and your fellow citizens, but all the others. You're pay, so you gladly pay tax to have the navy, you know, you, you, you have scientists um, who, who have the standard weights and measures. Um, you, have, you have standardized currency, coinage. And so essentially you're bootstrapping civilization through your own capitalistic greed. You're creating civilization accidentally, on purpose, and, and you're increasing the wealth of the city-state as you're increase, increasing your own wealth. So... You know, you have, the Greeks have these, these dynamic, incredible resources. They have the olive oil, they have the wine, um, and these, are, these extend your life. They, they fight off disease, and these are incredibly sought-after goods, um, value-added products that, that you can trade to other city-states for, for their raw materials. And you, in turn, do a little wheeling and dealing, and... You know, just, just the concept of being able to double your money ten times in one year, if you're lucky. If a storm doesn't come up and destroy your ships, if the pirates don't steal all your stuff, if you don't get cheated on standardized weights and measures, if a currency doesn't collapse or become 
generally regarded as worthless. Um, if your city state continues to function and the government, you know, looks after your interests and there's not, you know, social unrest, um, if you're not invaded by a foreign power, if you can keep all these things, this dynamic society rolling, I mean, just the very concept of capitalism is, you know, you as one individual can help collectively arm the populace and fight off a giant evil empire. Just one humble little city-state of Athens combined with these other people, these very dynamic societies. And this is not just, this dynamism is not just found in economics and the capitalism of the era. It's also found, that's where you get the explosion in the arts and sciences. This, this enables this, this pre-Cambrian explosion to take place. So capitalism is very much um, intertwined with this pre-Cambrian explosion of science and the arts. You know, mathematics, architecture, theater, all the things that we hold high and all the things that make our lives worth living. You know, flow from this intellectual freedom, this intellectually fantastic dynamic place is very much tied up with capitalism. So we want, we want to understand, you know, our roots and that how important capitalism is to who we are and where we've come from. Far from perfect, it has inherent weaknesses, it has inherent flaws within it, and it contains the seeds of its own destruction within it. It's the paradox. Okay, so the, the city-state is very resilient from without. It's very fragile from within because there's a paradox about capitalism. And the paradox of capitalism is the Pareto distribution. Everybody's, from my generation, has played Monopoly. Okay, what happens? Well, you sit down with three or four, four people, let's say. You start playing Monopoly. Everybody gets money, and you're buying properties, and you're rolling the dice, and everybody's having fun, and we're all accruing wealth. As we go through, and about you know about thirty minutes or an hour and a half in, everything's pretty good. It's you know some people are getting more money than others, but everybody's on the board and everybody owns property, and it's a very dynamic, fluid situation. Well, you cut to the the three or four hour three hour mark. Well, maybe I played a little longer than I should have. You know, a, a, about two or three hours into this game, it takes too long. Of Monopoly, what you see is all the wealth has accrued to one person. There's only two people left that are playing the game. Two people have crashed out, have gone broke, and cashed in all their property. They're out of the game completely. They have no property. They have no money. They're non-player characters. <laughs> they're sitting there starving beside, beside, and they're not very happy. There's two players left. One guy is has got all the money and three-quarters of the property. One person is left with the least valuable property on the board, and he, it's only got a quarter of it, 20 or 25 percent left, and he's down to his last like $500, and he's trying to make it around the board. Well, he lands on this guy's properties. He has to start mortgaging his properties. He has to start, you know, paying all the rest of his wealth to this guy. And after three or four, four or four times of landing on this guy's properties again, which is inevitable. He crashes out economically completely. Monopoly is capitalism, okay? One guy, if you play long enough, one person is going to accrue all of the wealth to themselves, okay? This is very much akin to the Pareto distribution. The Pareto distribution essentially is for all, uh, is not just about capitalism and economics, it's about all creative human endeavors. 10% of the people in an economy, or, or let's say, let's say uh, artists who are painting, okay, there's a hundred people painting, 10, 10 of the painters are going to create 50% of the paintings, okay, because just because that's the nature of humanity, 10% of the, of, the, of the population is going to do 50% of the work. Um, this is not to disparage the others, so it's, it's, um, it's like it's like a square root function, um, and so you see this. Let, let's take a. I'm more familiar with the music. Okay, so you have you have all these composers in in 1750 who are composing this incredibly, you know, uh, unparalleled music. You know the Austrian composers, etc. And they're in Vienna, and they're all basically contemporaries. And, you know, all these guys all over Europe are writing this incredible music. Well, 
10% of these people are creating 50% of the, of the work. And of that, you know, you're, you're not going to hear, you're going to hear only 10% of this work. So, so what, you, what you hear played on the radio is actually, you know, it's, most of it is from this 10% of the artists, musicians, and then of that work that they create, only 10% of that gets played most of the time. So you're looking at a square root of the square root. So you, you know, start with a thousand and you're listening, you know, a square root of a thousand is a hundred. And so you're listening to a hundred songs, but most of the songs they play are the same 10 songs, basically the square root of that. Um, so the Pareto distribution applies to painters. It applies to musicians. It applies to, across all human endeavors that 10% of the people are going to do 50% of the work. This is why communism failed when, when Stalin identifies the kulaks, the wealthy farmers, landowners, as the enemies of the people. These are the guys, these are the 10% who are creating 50% of the food, and the wealth in this system. This is universal all across time. So what he does is he convinces um, the poor people and, and the lower middle class and the ne'er-do-wells and, and the prison convicts to go in and, and, and the army, he takes the army, he takes all of their food, he takes all of their animals, he takes all of their stored food, he takes all of their seed corn, um, and he leaves them destitute and ships out most of them out to Siberia and the other half he leaves in place to starve, you know, and he blocks off the, the, the railroads in and out of this place so you know if you can walk 2,000 miles without eating good luck to you so they starve in place these people are digging up graveyards and eating corpses they're eating their children okay tens of millions of people starve to death not because what he did to the kulaks but you know there wasn't 10 million kulaks the kulaks were producing 50 percent of the product of the wealth of the food so once all of a sudden you take 50% of the food production off the table, you have a mass starvation event. Okay, this is catastrophic. This is why um, uh, Marxism fails, because Karl Marx did not understand the Pareto distribution. So we've spent 100 years and 100 million deaths because people like me and you don't understand math. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Karl Marx, you know, it's scientific socialism. He, he couches it in scientific terms, and he, you know, he has these pretensions of math and science. He's just pulling this out of his hat. He doesn't know what the heck he's talking about. Okay, this is, this is all pie in the sky. There's nothing scientific about it. There's nothing economic about it. It's just, it's just resentment, jealousy, and greed, and, and, and naked self-interest. And it led, you know, it led to the starvation event of, of I, I guess, by the time Stalin was through, 35 million people were dead. And basically, because we don't understand capitalism, and, and because the capitalism has this in, inherent paradox, you know, we, we have these flights to socialism for the last hundred years, we've lost a million people a year, you know killed by the government, mostly their own government, starved to death, um, exiled and worked to death, um, hunger and disease, execution. Stalin himself personally signed a million death warrants. So, you know, if I seem a little harsh on, on the postmodernist, politically correct, neo-Marxism, we've already done the experiment, okay? The results are in, starting in, you know, like 19... 22, they had the second and, and then the, th the following year, the third comma turn, where, where these revolutionary, you know, uh, sons of the upper middle class m met in Moscow and, and, and planned their world domination of, of uh, you know, of the, the scientific proletariat and, and how they're going to, you know, remake the world into this utopia at, at, out of the barrel of a gun, essentially. We've done the experiment for a hundred years. It's been a hundred years. The, the results are in. It's, it's a million dead a year. So, you know, I'm, I'm not being too harsh on these people. 
So we, we don't understand this process, and, and we're engaged in this Greek city-state process ourselves. We've gone from democracy to oligarchy, and what Trump is, is he is the tyrant. He is the guy who's supposed to go in and reset the economic, political, military table <clears throat> into something that the, the larger society can live with. <clears throat> He's supposed to take away the power that is concentrated in the hands of the oligarchy, ideally, the tyrant does, and redistribute this power, diffuse it throughout society to wipe out the, the crippling debt, to you know re reset the land distribution or, or what have you whatever was necessary to do in that society at that time. So this is, this is the system working as it has always worked, okay? This is not the collapse and the failure in the system. This is how the system has always worked. Democracy, oligarchy, tyranny, ideally back to democracy. Now, you know, where this is going, you know, whether, whether the tyrant fails to do the reset, whether the tyrant tries to usurp, you know, total power, whether this becomes, you know, the Republic dies under the, under some kind of tyranny, or whether the Republic dies under some kind of oligarchy, or whether it gets reset and goes back to democracy and is reinvigorated, re, uh, renewed, and, and, and it becomes a new American century. This has all happened many, many times before. So, uh, uh, read your history, boys and girls. <laughs> know the truth and it shall set you free. Okay, well, I haven't really covered as much as I like because I'm kind of verbose, kind of going over here, going over here for a little bit. And uh, we've gone over the magic hour, and I do apologize. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try and pick this back up, um, basically to talk about why, why, that this, why, why, um, why empires fail. You know, we're very much, you know, kind of an empire without, you know, the territorial claims on other, on other states and other peoples. But uh, I think we can say that we're an empire. Um, and, you know, the American empire, we need to understand why empires fail. Uh, is another important component of this um, realization uh, well, just very briefly, okay, why do empires fail? Empires fail because of the rent-seeking behavior by the elites. The sciences in, the social sciences have already done this. They've written about it in depth. We understand perfectly why empires fail, why the Ottoman Roman Empire failed, why the Ottoman Empire failed, why these, why these most successful empires all through history have failed. You know, what they do is the elites grab control of the, the, the reins of power, political, economic power. It accrues into the hands of a few through the Pareto distribution, um, in a sense, a very, a very mathematical, um, almost unavoidable system. They, they, these elites, they pass along this vast inherited fortunes and the political power, their offices. While you know, you've seen these politicians and they have sons and daughters, and the sons and daughters come up and they're sitting in their Senate seat or or the son becomes president, you know, this is a very organic process. So what happens is these elites, they pass along these vast inherited fortunes and the political power <clears throat> while exempting themselves from the taxes that other people pay. You know, how much, ta you know, the, the most wealthy corporations in human history, you know, Amazon, Google, um, um, Facebook, you know, how much tax do they pay? Goose egg, zero. So you're seeing this, you know, play out very much in our lifetimes on, on a daily basis, which these, you know, repeating forms that is history. Their wealth buys political power. So you become a billionaire, you take your billions, and you use them, and you buy political power, which makes you, you know, for your comparative advantage, then this makes you accrue more wealth. So you're not like a billionaire. Now you're like a hundred billionaire. You're like one of these super wealthy guys now who's, I mean, that's vel virtually what these people are worth. They're the richest people in our country worth just under, if you wait a couple of weeks, somebody's going to break the $100 billion mark. <laughs> Take my word for it, okay? So these are $100 billion. Now you've got $100 billion. You've taken your wealth. You've bought political power for your comparative economic advantage. You've accrued $100 billion now. You take that, you buy even more political power. So it's unavoidable. You can't help but... but control the political process and manipulate it for your own parochial, you know, selfish um, advantage. It's natural. You're maximizing profits. 
you're you're feeding into your own ego but basically you're doing what you're supposed to do is you're making as much money as you can for yourself and for your corporation for your enterprise it's a feedback loop is what i'm describing so the concentration of wealth and power has a crowding out effect you know how many hundred billionaires can this country have before the man on the street you know is basically you know, what's left for everybody else would be the rhetorical question. Their concentration of wealth and power has a crowding out effect on the economic life of the people who eventually, I'm the one who's paying all the taxes, you know, I make I make forty or $50,000 a year if I'm lucky, you know, that we have diminishing returns, diminishing wages over the last 30 years. So my economic life is becoming more and more constrained over time. And eventually, I lose the incentive to struggle because my rewards, my share of the rewards is decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. And I can see this, you know. So why should I go out and work hard and do this dynamic, why should I strive, you know, why should I try as hard as I do? Why should I do my job with rigor and, and demand excellence, you know? And I'm not getting anything out of it. I'm basically working for the state while I'm seeing these the super rich, you know, go into the hundreds of billions of dollars and they're not paying any tax and they're taking, you know, a, a huge chunk of all of my disposable income as far as I'm concerned, you know, to pay to the poor. Why should I participate in this system? I've lost the incentive. I've lost the drive and, and I've lost my standard of living. It's diminishing, diminishing, diminishing. This is exactly what we're seeing now. So the farmers of ancient Rome were taxed so heavily that farming no longer became profitable. They move into the cities, they leave the land fallow. The empire is hollowed out from within and it's waiting for some external force to come along and push over the rotten walls of this edifice. So the state essentially uh, sabotages itself from within through this timeless process. Are we about to, you know, are we going to follow the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire? Um, this is, this is not out, out of the question. So we're currently, you know, we're over 100% GDP of debt and, uh, you know, we, we've elected the tyrant um, in parentheses the good tyrant, he's staying within the law, you know, basically. So, what's the ultimate outcome? You know, history is a very dynamic situation, and uh, um, history is not written, there is no predestination. So, every day when you and I, we get up, we go to work, um, we take care of ourselves, we take care of our families, um, we do our, do right by our you know, co-workers, our fellow students, and and the, and the people, you know, in our society. Um, this is very much, the outcome is very much incumbent upon us, upon you and upon me. What happens, whether we actually do succeed as a civilization, as a republic, and, or if we fail, like the Greeks eventually failed, the Romans eventually failed, you know, and these are, these are catastrophic outcomes with catastrophic consequences. You know, death and despair and starvation and um, really terrible outcomes at these collapse events. So this is what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to chart a course for the middle class. We're going to bring back the middle class. We're going to reinvigorate this republic politically, economically, spiritually. We're going to renew our democracy. Now, I apologize for going over, and uh, <laughs> once again, this is Marshall Gregory Thomas um, here with the 28th Amendment, and in the Tiny Concert Series, we'll have another concert probably this evening for you, uh, just a tiny concert, uh, one, two, three, three songs, we'll keep it very brief, and so hopefully if you can join us. Now, very, th very thanks, thankful to you for uh, being with me today, can't thank you enough, and um, just remember, nothing is written, and every day is, you know, every night we take the gift of sleep, and every morning we greet the rosy, roseate fingers of dawn, and we rise, and we set about in that moment of infinite possibility. So today is your infinite moment of possibility. So take your destiny with both hands, and, and do your duty, do your best by yourself as a person, worthy of, of love and respect, and by others equally. 
as you would have them do you. And uh, thank you and God bless. And without question, we love you.